Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the CDSS Common Time series. I'm delighted to see all of you. My name is Joanna Reiner Wilkinson, and I am the Director of Programs for CDSS. And this is a relatively new series that we have going. This is our third program in this series. And we hope to bring you different topics every month, and we welcome your ideas for what we should bring you in the future. Tonight, we're excited to talk about the Dance It Yourself video series, which was created by our Educators Task Group, which is led by Robin Marcus, who's going to lead our presentation tonight. Robin is a CDSS board member, a musician, an educator, and Robin, I'm going to hand things over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Joanna. It's, um, it's great to have you all here. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir looking at this group of folks, but um, thank you all for coming. It's so wonderful to have you. And I feel like you're going to have as much to contribute to this conversation in many ways as we are. So we will certainly have some time for comments and Q&A uh, as we go along. So the Dance It Yourself series came about um, because uh, during the summer of 2020, I was teaching a graduate course in um, Alexander Technique, one of the many things that I do. And my music students, it was Alexander Technique for music teachers. And my music teachers said, basically, help, because they knew that I have taught a lot of folk dance and done school presentations for years and many workshops and they said we need help because we need ways to adapt dance we can't sing next year and what are we going to do how are we going to continue movement in schools or what are we going to do with our kids at that point who are mostly going to be in virtual learning having suffered through three months of virtual school they were like we don't even know what to do so the educational ta task group of the CDSS board was functioning on bringing awareness about CDSS to teachers through conferences and through active things and through being out there in person. And we didn't know what we were going to do either. And so it suddenly struck me that finding a way to adapt some of the beloved family dance repertoire and put it into one or two person capsules the way we had been doing um, at contra dances online uh, would be the effective thing to do and to try to get that material out to teachers as fast as we possibly could as fast as we possibly could ended up looking like december <laughs> because making each one of these things is a very time consuming process of every section being filmed independently and married together one at a time until we could create the entire video. So there is at this point a series of six dance videos plus the introductory video uh, in the can. And we have received funding both from the Organization of American Kodai Educators and the Bay Area Country Dance Society um, to go ahead and do another package of six videos. And hopefully I'm gonna get off my can and get those started um, as soon as this is over. Um, part of the holdup has been, what are we looking for? Are we looking for larger adaptations? Are we staying with one or two person dances? And the way we've been thinking about that has shifted again, just in the last couple of months. So we're trying to meet the needs of what's out there. I think we probably will now at this point stick with the smaller dances again. But anyway, what we have out there, I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see this. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Joanna. Joanna's sharing the YouTube page. And you can see on the YouTube page, here are the various videos. The um, the shortest, of course, is the introductory video, but of the dances, they run from a little over seven minutes to almost 12, with them averaging around eight or nine. And um, they come sort of in two categories. So Joanna, if you could stop that share and let me share the teacher's guide. This is the table of contents in the downloadable teacher's guide. 
And I have them grouped in the teacher's guide into two sections, traditional dances, which would be Gallipede starring the one and only Margaret Berry. Yay, Margaret, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Heel Toe Polka with Diane Silver, Kinder Polka with Jolaine um, Porconi, and you'll see that one a little bit more this evening. And then in the composed dances, we have um, Zemmer Atik, which is really truly a composed dance by a choreographer in Israel. Family Road Trip by Sue Hall Sether, Yippee Yahoo, thank you Sue for joining us this evening. And Wavelets by Claire Takamori, who will be talking a little bit more about her process of creating that dance later in the evening in this presentation. So, um, each of the sections goes through various things with the dances. And I'm just going to show you Gallipede because it's right here. So in Gallipede, we have an introduction. These introductions are also on the YouTube of each video, telling you a little bit about the dance itself, about the history of the dance, where it came from, particularly if it's a, tra a traditional dance, and a little bit about our caller and musicians. Then, each section of the teacher's guide has the dance directions for the traditional dance, the full dance in the, the set, the long way set for as many as will. And then um, it has the dance directions for the adapted gallopede for one dancer or for two dancers. And these are the ways that you'll see these things in the video. There is the sheet music. And then there are a whole section of extensions for each of the dances about the caller, about the musicians, information on the dance, historical information that I could find on the internet um, that teachers can use to extend their lessons into um, multiple lessons, hopefully, about the dances that are related to this one or that are involved with this one. So, what I thought I would do let me stop that share, is to let you take a look at Kinder Polka. And Kinder Polka is a finger shaking dance. And actually, um, many of you on the screen right this minute were involved in helping me research this dance. So you may see your name <laughs> uh, as things go by. So each of the videos also has sections to it. There is an introduction where I essentially read the written introduction and tell you a little bit about the dance, hopefully in a shorter way that will get kids excited as well. And then there is a teaching section where the caller teaches the dance and the dancers are there uh, responding. Then I come back for a pause section where we instruct children who might be watching this at home by themselves what to do if they don't understand. And then there is the dance itself. And the dances are done five times through with live music, in quotes. So we're going to see um, a little bit of Kinder Polka. And we're not going to watch the whole thing. You can watch it on your own. But we're going to take a look at first Jolaine doing a little bit of the teaching section. So Joanna, we're ready for you to show that to us. Hi, I'm Jolaine, and I'm here to teach you the dance Kinder Polka. You can dance this with a partner, or you can imagine a partner. Face your partner and give both hands. The dance begins by stepping out to one side and bringing the other foot over to meet. Step out to one side, bring the other foot to meet, and then stomp three times. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Now we go back the way we came. Step to the side. Bring your other foot to me. Step to the side, bring your other foot to me, and stomp three times. And now we do that whole thing again. Step together, step together, stomp, stomp, stomp. Step together, step together, stomp, stomp, stomp. Now with your partner, you'll do a little patty cake thing. Clap your knees twice, clap your partner's hands twice, clap your own hands three times. And you repeat that. Clap your knees twice, tap your partner's hands twice, clap your own hands three times. The next part, you take your right finger and shake it at your partner as though you're scolding, in a friendly way, of course. 
Shake, shake, shake. Now with your left hand, shake, shake, shake. Now you're friends again. Shake hands with your partner and turn yourself around. And the dance begins again from here. Uh, Robin, you're muted. Thank you, Jacob. So then after she teaches the dance again, we have the, the center section with the pause. And then we have a little bit of this adapted kinder polka for you to get to hear with music. And our, um, by the way, our dancers are a wonderful family from Berea, Kentucky. Uh, the mom runs the dance program there um, for Christmas week. Uh, and they were utterly delighted to be involved and they absolutely wanted all four of them in the video. So, um, but one of the things that I love is that in these videos, one of them um, was shot in a New York City apartment where there was this much room. So you can really see the different living spaces that people have, how much room they have to move in and how they have adapted the dance for their particular space, which I feel like is encouraging. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at the dancing part. And if you're so moved to get up and dance a little bit of Kinder Polka, please do. Okay, so um, if you need a little stretch break. All right, Joanna, so we're ready to look at the dance itself. Robin, are we going to look at the, the talking portion in the middle or just the dancing part? Oh, you know, we could. But yeah, let's take a, let's take a look at that so that you can see how that works. All right. Time back to check in and make sure that you are comfortable and know what to do when the music starts. So if you're really not sure of the moves of the dance and you'd like some help before the music begins, here's a few things you can try. One, if you're watching this with your class at school, your teacher can pause the video right now and answer questions to help you out. Two, if you're home by yourself, Go back to the beginning of the video and watch the teaching again. Make sure you're moving along with the caller's teaching to get the steps in your body. Three, if you can, find someone else in your house to be your partner. It's always easier to have a live person to dance with. So there's time to go run, do whatever they need to do. And then we come back and we'll watch a little bit uh, one time through this dance. Okay, hopefully now everyone is back and we are ready to dance. Here we go. Here we go. Step together, step together, stomp, stomp, stomp. 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 Knees, knees, hands, hands, clap, clap, clap. Knees, knees, hands, hands, clap, clap, clap. Right and left. Shake hands, turn around. Here we go. Step together, step together, stomp, stomp, stomp. 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 Knees, knees, hands, hands, clap, clap, clap. Knees, knees, hands, hands, clap, clap, clap. Right and left. Shake hands, turn around. Do it again. Okay, and so on from there. So the musicians there are Casey, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, Casey Murray and Molly Taylor. And they, did I get it wrong, Claire? Tucker. Claire? What? <laughs> I knew I was going to get it wrong. He's right, it's Molly Tucker. Molly Tucker. I want her to be Molly Taylor very, very badly. Yeah, Casey Murray and Molly Tucker. And they are wonderful musicians from um, upstate New York, I think. Uh, and they are, <laughs> she's laughing at me again. I'm wrong again. They were in Vermont. 
in Vermont. Anyway, and, and behind them, the snow is falling off the roof as they're playing. It's kind of marvelous. So um, yes, the smallest dancer is absolutely delightful. She's just having the best time. And as it goes on and on and gets faster and faster, that's very funny too. Um, so it is it is a lovely, lovely little, little video. Um, and so basically each of the videos does that uh, exact same process. It has me giving an introduction, the teaching, the um, the actual pausing, the dance with the with the live musicians there. And there we have dancers, callers, and musicians from all over the U.S. that are participating. Um, okay. So the other thing that we have then is the section of the guide that is the non-traditional dances, the composed dances. And I just wanted to sort of um, get you involved in a little bit of the process for that. Oh, but before, actually, before we leave Kinder Polka, pardon me, I wanted to thank everybody from Poor Parlay. So, um, if you take a look uh, in the classrooms extension section, let me share that with you so you can see it. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by being wrong, <laughs> as I do. Um, okay, so over here we have the classroom extensions. Um, finger shaking dances go very far back in history. Um, and the videos that many of you sent me um, bring us back to a family of dances that involve these finger shaking moves and of a, a family of highly interrelated dance, which can be used as phenomenal extensions from Kinder Polka for further lessons in the classroom. So we, I thought we would take a look at, as a group, at some of these little videos that came up. So first of all, the, um, Bob Walzer sent me original sheet music for the 1927 version of Kinder Polka, which is a very different tune. Um, and Lorraine Miner sent us the sheet music for the Swedish version. Um, and then the Stockton Folk Dance Camp version of Kinder Polka was here from their actual um, guide, which is very cool. But what I wanted to take a look at was some of these related dances that you guys sent me. So I thought we would first take a look at um, which one? The Polka de Bebe, which is almost exactly, this is a French variant of Kinder Polka. So go ahead, Joanna, and you can, I will stop my share and you can show us that one. And so on and so on. Um, and then there is the fabulous goat dance. <laughs> so let's take a look at this one. Uh, this is from, I'm not sure where this is from, somewhere. Um, oh, Gascon, France, that's right. And this is called Adour and Piquet. But look at these guys on stilts. It is just mind boggling to me, but you'll see a very similar clap pattern again. And the music sounds very, very familiar as well. What I like is that they are more in a set and their set reshapes and reforms in different directions. And you'll get a small sense of that in this clip. So go ahead, Joanna.
Okay, and that should be fine. Thank you. Yeah, so they don't have the finger shaking in that one, but you can hear the tune and you can definitely see the clapping pattern. And then the oldest one uh, from Arbo's Arcosography is the Washerwoman's Bronla. And this is perhaps the oldest finger shaking dance that we, we have access to. And this is a, a dance troupe, obviously, uh, very beautiful two very beautiful dancers. But what I love is if you wanted to use this one in your classroom, they're already giving you a two person adaptation of what was obviously a circle dance. So let's go ahead and watch this beautiful couple. Would absolutely be accessible by older elementary students. So that's very beautiful to watch. Okay, so questions about anything um, concerning these, the traditional dances or this section. Um, I do want to say that there is actually, I'm going to share my screen one more time. There's actually a whole page since all of you are here and I just am so pleased. There is a whole section here thanking you. Um, everyone in Poor Parlay who sent me uh, things, Paul Rosenberg and Patricia Campbell, of course. And um, so thank you and thank you for, for coming. And I'm so glad I picked this dance to feature. So all of those links were, are in the downloadable teacher's guide, which is on the CDSS website under educator resources, dance it yourself. Okay, any questions? should probably look at what's in the chat. So there are no questions, but Mady points out in the chat that there is another similar dance that she's found to Kinder Polka. So that's something that we can all check out at some point. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Mady. That's great. So you will, uh, we can save the chat too for the end, which would be great. Um, okay. So um, moving on to the non-traditional dance section. So um, I wanted to have Claire talk for a lot of reasons. Um, one, because her, her teaching and her organization are just exquisite. And two, because she has been so instrumental in helping all of us figure out choreography for this new, very odd, weird, internet era of teaching and dancing. And so um, I really enjoyed hearing about Claire's process from bringing um, a couple of traditional, well, a traditional dance, a composed dance, marrying them together to create another family dance, and then figuring out what things in that that she loved that would work for internet dancing. So I'm going to actually let her talk a little bit about wavelets. Claire. Thanks, Robin. I'm going to give you a disclaimer. I'm not an expert. I'm just going to be sharing some ideas that work for me. There are many ways to teach dance, and you can use things similar to what you're already using for teaching other subjects. Here's an outline of what I'd like to cover. Um, first, concise teaching. Second, learning with all your senses. Third, preparing the dances before you teach them. And fourth, adapting the dances. And that's where I'll talk a little bit about wavelets. So first, I'd like to talk to you about concise teaching. For learning dances, many people like concise teaching and calling. Some do like more words, but finding that balance with enough words but not an auditory overload is really tricky. So here are some tips that I used to make my teaching more concise. First, start writing out 
exactly what you want to say word for word and then review it and cut out words to increase clarity and to decrease the uh, word content. Then repeat that a few more times. Really, you'd be surprised how many words you can cut out. Next, you can record yourself teaching. I realize that this is a tough ask, but um, if you listen to it back as if you're the student, like dance along with your teaching, then again, you cut out words, um, edit for clarity, and then repeat that process a few more times. Next, you want to practice the phrases that you use often so that those become just part of your vocabulary. Maybe you'll teach how to take hands in a circle, how to make a line, how to do a do -si do anything that you're using frequently, practice that until it just flows out of your mouth. For contra and English dances, and maybe other dances, we use this formula for teaching and calling. Who, what, and until. Who are the ones moving? With your partner, take two hands. What is the movement? Take two hands and circle around with your partner. Until is how far you're going to take that movement. You can go all the way around, halfway around, until they're with their partner or until they're facing up towards me. The next thing I'd like to talk about is learning with your senses. It also seems helpful to incorporate a wide range of learning styles and some of the senses in whatever you're teaching. Show it so they'll see, tell it so they'll hear, do it together so they'll be moving and their body will learn, and use your imagination so they'll remember a little bit better. And if you can, with the imagination, incorporate signs of smell and taste. So it seems a little contradictory to tell a story and use concise teaching language. It's all about that balance. I probably would not use a story with every dance unless it's super engaging and really works for those students. But you can use short sensory engaging descriptions to help with an ideal like moving through the water to get a slow, smooth movement, jumping like a frog, or skipping like a deer. The next thing I'd like to talk about is preparing dances. You want to, as you make your plan for what dance and what order you're going to teach dances in, you want to build skills slowly. It's kind of like building a vocabulary. Add one new skill each time you teach a dance. So you want to aim for a skill level that's easy for that age, to learn quickly and feel successful. So that's a good guide whenever you can. Um, you're aiming for something that's easy for them to do and feel successful. You can also try teaching just the first part of the dance and dance that over and over and over again. And then you add the next piece the next time. Another thought is to teach the tricky part first and then work backwards, adding on as you go along. Um, instead of going from the top down, you'd go from the bottom up. So um, that's a shout out to Sue Hulsether who taught me that. Um, so you might start with part four and then get that really good. That's the hardest part. And then you add on three and then you add on two. And then maybe one was something that they've already done before, like a long line forward and back. Things that I think are tricky are group movements. Anytime, like if you had to do a peel the banana, anytime the whole group has to do something together is a little bit harder to learn than just moving by yourself. Something that's fast, if you have to get there in two beats, it's a lot harder to get right than moving there in eight beats. I find when young people are turned around, um, even a do-si-do -si -do or even a turn around yourself can be confusing where to stop or where to end, so that's a tricky one. And anytime you're disconnected from everybody else. So a circle would be easier than walking single file in some cases. Other cases, not. Um, having fun is the easiest way to learn. So make it silly, funny, make it cool. Um, you could add props. Um, you know, waving a little uh, ribbon might be entertaining and engaging. Making a game out of it. So instead of a doing a just a plain do -si do you can do um, make a game about something about going around behind their back. Um, and then integrating other areas of study, inter interdisciplinary learning. So if you could add, throw in some science, some math, um, some English, write out the words that we're talking about. All of those incorporate different areas of the brain and make it the learning just a little bit easier. And there's one thing that I got from Bruce Hamilton, 
I got many things from Bruce Hamilton, but one thing that sticks out, and he talks about um, when you just learning, it's important to find that balance of doing it right or well and having fun. So consider if they did it perfectly, but they didn't enjoy it, and they never wanted to dance again, would that be a success? So if you'd like to get up and move around while I do this next bit, feel free to join me. Um, this is going to be an example of, I'm going to talk to you in a way of teaching that might use some of your help. So using the ideas that I've talked about, um, some of the folks could put things in chat if you'd like to about what could be done differently. So here we go. So I'm the teacher standing in front of the class, standing here, way over here. Okay, we're going to do a new dance, and it might be challenging. Let's find a partner and stand face to face. Now make a line of par pairs. Take a step away from your partner and notice the kids on either side of you. Everyone walk forward and stamp, and back up and stamp. Okay, so that was just a brief little um, scenario. And think about what sort of things I did not do ideally. I made this purposely to be a little wordy. I didn't pause a lot. There was no practice. There was no demonstrating what I'm talking about. And there was no story, so it wasn't very fun in my mind. Um, so here's how I might think about teaching the same scenario. Let's ask a partner. Let's ask a partner. Let's ask a partner. Three, two, one, ready, go. Everyone face your partner and say, you're my partner and give them a high 10. Now watch me. As you face your partner, everyone make two lines. We're standing side by side with other people and I'm looking at my partner. This is the way we make a line, make a line, make a line. This is the way we make a line early in the morning. So you can use any tune, obviously, but something that they already knew, you could use to engage them in that exercise. Some other tips I've found that are useful is you always want to identify the rights and lefts for younger kids because it's um, confusing for them. So both online and in person, I like to demo that facing away. So s they say, look at me, and this is my right hand, or this is my left hand. I would never say both at the same time. Um, mirroring, I find is very difficult. So I'm mirroring my left hand, and um, for some of that, some people that works. For most people, even adults, that's kind of challenging. Um, when you demonstrate claps, either with a partner or in person, I find it's best to demonstrate facing them directly. So this is right hands, this is left hands, both hands. And then if you were demonstrating something with a partner, I would actually turn and face them and clap this way. When you do a demonstration, you might consider doing the demonstration facing the same way you're going to be facing when you're doing the rest of the dance. So I typically show a do-si-do -si -do facing this way so you could see me sliding around my partner. But if I was required to teach a dance and face this way with my partner next to me, I would demonstrate the do-si-do -si -do this way. Even though it's not as clear, um, I've told that change of reference while watching a video is challenging. So you can play with that. Maybe you'll find that you can demonstrate it and then ev have everyone turn sideways afterwards. OK, next, we're going to talk about adapting dances. How would you adapt the choreography for your students' needs, your lesson plan, maybe you have a change, um, the space you have? Maybe you all have little spaces. Maybe you have a large space. And whether you're working online or dancing in person. So there are three of my dances in the Dance It Yourself Teaching Notes. Wavelets is the one in the video. Family Stars is another variation on that. And Beaumont Boom is a dance for any number of people done in person. The three dances begin with a similar choreographic idea, balancing twice, that's step together, step away, and then moving in a circle and then repeating that. One of the dances has you holding hands in a circle while you do all that. The other one has you holding hands in a star. Your hands are, so your right hands are in the middle of the star. And then one is a wave, so your hands are up like this, taking hands with your partner, and then you do a turn with that one hand. 
One consideration I make when changing a dance is adding something you need to teach or taking out something that you've already taught. You might also consider the height of the dancers. Waves and stories are hard when there's a height difference between an adult and a preschooler, because your hands are going to be up high or low. So holding two hands and taking a circle might work better when there's a height difference. Maybe you just did a dance with a circle and you prefer stars for variety, so you can swap out the stars for the circles. Also, the direction of movement of a particular move um, can make it harder or easier for some. Waves and stars balance to the sides. When you're in a circle and balancing, you're balancing forward and back. Um, I think that forward and back is a little bit easier on average for people. Um, you may also consider the ground that you'll dance on, whether it's grass or floor, and how um, hard that is to move and move at a specific pace. For wavelets, the dance in the video, I wanted to dance for one or two people. I wanted something that was easy to learn quickly that also works for kids and adults because folks were mostly at home still. And I wanted a dance that works in a very small space because a lot of people just had like a kitchen. So here's a video of wavelets. Um, I'll show the portion that I'm teaching it and then you can dance along for a little bit. Hi, I'm so excited that you're here. Are you ready to learn a fun dance? I know you know what an ocean wave is. A wavelet is a little tiny wave with one or two people. It begins by taking right hands. Here's your right hand. If you have someone to dance with, you take right hands together so you're facing in opposite directions. If you're dancing by yourself, you can dance with me. Take right hands with the camera and I'll be your partner. The dance begins with two balances. A balance is a step together. Looks like this. Beginning with your right foot, step to the right, touch left, step to the left, touch right. Do it again. Step, touch, step, touch. So we do that in the wave two times and then a right hand turn around your partner. Walk around. When you get back to where you started, put your left hands in for a wave to the left. Balance this time starting with your left foot. Left, touch, right, and left, touch, right. Now do a left hand turn around. The next part is three steps forward with a high 10. One, two, three, high 10, and back up. Then a do-si-do. -si -do. We're gonna slide around our partners, and it looks like this. Imagine I'm you, I'm facing my partner. Walk forward, passing right shoulders. Then we both slide to the right. We both back up until we get to back to where we started. You're gonna end the do-si-do -si -do close to your partner so you can clap. Looks like this. Together, right, together, left. Do it again. Together, right, together, left. And the last part is together, knees, together, high 10. And then you have four counts to come back to a new wave to start over the dance. Balance the wave to the right and left. Do it again, right and left, right hand turn. Put your left hands in, balance left, left and right, left and right, left hand turn. Four, three steps. High 10. Now do -si do slide around. And clapping. Together, right, together, left, together, right, together, left, together, knees. High 10. Make a wave, balance right. For the Americana dances, the musical phrase is eight or 16 beats. So we try to keep the movements we change to the same size phrase. Looking at balance the wavelet, a balance is step together, step together. That's four counts. So two balances are eight counts, two times four. The circle or star or the turn after we do the balances all take eight counts as well. So hopefully you can see that it's pretty easy to change the form of the balance and the circular part just by substituting a d another movement that lasts the same length. What if you want to take out the clapping part to make it easier? That portion is 16 beats and it follows after the movement of going forward and back and then a do -si do So you could take um, a circle left, go all the way around twice for 16 beats, or you can substitute a circle left and then a circle right instead of the claps. 
Um, just noting that the change in direction, circle left, changing to circle right, is hard for the very youngest people. It just, they need to keep moving in one direction. Um, there are usually four of those 16 beat phrases in an in American style dance. That means it's a total of 64 beats, so 16 times four. We also have dances that are not 64 beats and others that do not stick with the musical phrase, like a southern square. So if your kids are not moving fast enough or the carpet or glass, grass is slowing them down, totally fine to take 16 beats to do an eight beat move. Just know that when you start at the beginning of the music each time, um, you won't be at the same place with the dance. So that was a lot of information. I hope it was helpful for some of you. And feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Claire, I was also thinking that one of the things that we've also done in a lot of these videos, if you think about um, even the Kinder Polka video, what we've taken out is the progression. So if you're moving on to a new couple in these dances, it's the same in, in the adult contra dances, we find a way that you get to just stay put with your partner. So at the end of Kinder Polka, there would be that progression where you, you turn and face a new partner and we just had them shake hands and turn around and then face each other again. So all of the dances have found ways to eliminate the progression. That's a big one um, in order to keep dancing with the same person comfortably. Uh, some of those fit the format better than others, right? <laughs> so I'm sure that you had to eliminate that too when you were formulating wavelets. Uh, Wavelets was written for online, so yeah, it, it didn't include a progression. And I guess I've been doing yeah. this for so long online that I forgot about progression. I know. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> We've all gotten kind of used to this format. So, But I think for teachers who are um, thinking about taking this on themselves who maybe aren't as familiar with dance, one of the things to know to do is how do you eliminate progression? What can you figure out to do instead? And how do you eliminate moves? What what are the moves that seem to work best? And maybe you said this and we lost you, but what are the moves that work the very best uh, in this internet format? So balances, yes. What, what were some of the other things that you said that we might've missed? Um, I, I heard two things one how to progress and how not to progress and then also moves that worked well is that what the two things yeah what are the moves that you find um work best on the internet um they're not necessarily the same thing for kids um well i guess so for contra dances we liked bouncy things so um balancing waves balancing rings balancing your partner all of that was very accessible. It doesn't move a lot in your space. And so the same thing, balance, and then Petronella spin to the right. For family dances, it's kind of the same thing, right? Um, I have space to go forward. Um, kids like to jump, so you know we might include some jumping as opposed to um, a do -si do or something. You might have them jump four times. So you can take moves that are smooth and then create them in that way. Yeah. Clapping uh, works exceptionally well. Thank you. I had an interesting conversation just today on Facebook with a teacher who went to all of her uh, staff meetings this week to start school tomorrow. And at three o'clock today was informed that she was not gonna be in her room, that she was gonna be on a cart and that she could no longer sing this year. So back to the kids staying in the classrooms and the teachers going to them. Right, right, like 12 hours before school starts. So I pointed her to the videos and she said, but we're not supposed to dance either because we're not supposed to do a lot of aerobic stuff. And I mm -hmm. said, well, a lot of these don't move very much. <laughs> and a lot of them involve clapping and you can do that or you can modify them. And I really wanted to say, come here, but I knew she's starting school in six hours and that was the last thing she needed to do tonight. But, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that is, it, that's not unusual, I don't think. I'm sorry to say, because no one knows really what they're doing till the very last second. And so having things available for people who really can't do massive movements, how can we keep the movements small? I'm, I'm saying this to all of you because I know you have school gigs. So how do we keep those movements small? How do we keep things in one place? How do we keep the kids from 
doing a lot of heavy breathing. Scary, hard, not fun, but here we are again. Yeah. Um, but yes, Claire, thank you. So many brilliant ideas. And, and I do really, really um, appreciate your time, uh, especially this week. So thank you for being with us. Um, okay, so talking about classroom mechanics, and I guess I got that started talking about this young teacher today, but what can we do? How can we use these videos going forward? And so I'm gonna introduce um, my, my dear colleagues and friends, Mary Epstein, who is a retired um, music teacher who runs the Kodai training program at um, the Kodai Musical Institute, or she is retired from doing that as well now. But are you still teaching, Mary? No. No, she's really retired. This is so cool. But Mary and I have known each other for about 40 years, and she's a wonderful teacher and a very creative thinker. And Amy Christensen, who um, just graduated from the Kodai program at George Mason University. And Amy is the person who is responsible for getting these videos kicked off in the first place, who said, Robin, help, um, and said, this is what we want you to do. And so here we are. <laughs> so thank you, Amy, for um, getting this process started. And I don't know if you guys have anything you want to talk about um, using the videos for or how you think you would use them going forward. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I'm thrilled about this program. I'm so excited about it. Um, because I, I currently teach um, preschool music and we have about 100, 140 kids in our preschool this year. Um, but it's obviously a very tricky um, situation where you know we can't sing and um, and this is so exciting to me because this is so useful um, in our classes. And I think what the way that I would approach, say, the Kinder Polka, which you've already um, shown, Robin, um, the way that I would approach the Kinder Polka would probably be to save the video, obviously watch it quite a few times on my own, but save it and not show it to the kids for a few weeks. Teach all of these moves. Um, I tend to teach things with my parachute because it's fun, because we can take it outside. It helps us stay in a circle when we're doing circle things. Um, um, but there's a lot of different ways that, you know, to to take the moves of say um, the step together, step together, stomp, stomp, stomp. Of course, we can practice that just that much, you know, marching around with our parachute or um, you know, many other things that that we can use in the classroom, spreading way out or starting to do that with a partner, which I don't do a lot of partner work in preschool. I tend to stick with big group, but um, but just teaching these moves step by by step in that way. After a few weeks, after we've learned all of these moves, um, you know, in little parts, um, then I would show the video, probably in class, um, together. And by then, because I've been using the same terminology, step together, step together, stomp, 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 and all of those, if I've been using the same terminology that has been taught, um, on the video, then it it isn't so crazy. They're not really thrown by this. It's like, oh, I know this and I know how this works and they can jump right in with it. And then you can send it home. Um, and sending it home is the really exciting part to me because families can open this up, kids can do it and they get to be the expert with their families. Um, I just think that's so cool. Even a, even a four-year-old um, can say, I have something to teach you and teach their family. And the family will be successful because you're not depending on a four-year-old's memory, you're watching it happen on the <laughs> screen. And yet, you know, they learned it and they're the ones and they're showing and this is their thing that they own already. Um, I just think that's so cool. So I'm, um, that's kind of how I would, how I would approach it um, in my class is kind of save the video until we learned it well enough and we've kind of internalized it and then send it home and let them be the, the expert. So that's kind of in an ideal situation though in that we got to teach it in class together you know, so hopefully that will um, be the case in my preschool and in um, in schools, you know, that we can all learn these things together before sending them home. But I also think that these videos are so well organized and well taught that you could send it home and say, families, this is, you know, these are resources that you can learn and you can use at home without, you know, having been taught necessarily by me beforehand. So, um, 
yeah, I just think they're incredible resources and will be very useful. And that's that's how I would approach it. Um, and then in terms of um, of adapting the dances kind of down the road, um, if kids are you know doing this mostly in small spaces and practicing them mostly with their families at home, when we come back into the classroom, um, I don't think it would be difficult at all to kind of adapt these back in when they've already learned these moves and they've kind of become really comfortable with that um, to start adding more groups. And like Claire was saying, you know, to, to adapt them a little bit, you can add, you know, add some more students and have them jump in together and have a group of four instead of two or um, things like that. I think that would be a very seamless process because of how they're taught. Um, so if I can just continue from where you ended the paragraph before uh, with the family aspect of it, take, sending it home. That's actually where, when uh, I started watching these videos, um, and, and I know it was before mid-December, so I don't know when you sent it to me, Robin, uh, because uh, I, I'm, you can't tell now it's dark, but I'm in the country right now which is where we hid out during COVID, most of COVID. Of course, COVID is still here. So we're, again, <laughs> uh, so I called my husband into the room and he is a professional percussionist. Um, and, and he, you know, but that doesn't mean that he can do with his feet what he can do with his hands. Uh, but these, the way these were um, organized, all of these videos, they were simple enough that you could grasp them almost immediately. Uh, one watch through, actually, probably two. Um, and so there we were, you know, in the dining room right here, if I could show it to you, um, dancing with Dance It Yourself videos. I loved it. Um, space is an issue. Uh, space is something that teachers have to think about all the time. And uh, I, I think Claire would make a wonderful music teacher. Uh, <laughs> She has got it all down. What she said about the phrase length, by the way, when I had to analyze all 32 Beethoven sonatas, um, I, I actually noticed that his phrases were four measures long, plus four, eight, 16, 32, 64. And I actually wrote that down in, in one of my um, analysis classes. Um, and somebody said, wow, where'd you learn that? And I think it was because I am I move and I think like that. So Claire, thank you for saying those musical phrase lengths so so vividly. Um, but the space is an is something that we have to contend with all the time. And so here you are at home. You can do it at home. You can do it in with the person in front of the camera. I like that you could do it with you, Claire. <laughs> Um, you can do it with one person, but when you get into a classroom, uh, most, most American music classrooms are music classrooms. I have taught in both situations where you ha actually have a lovely space, and then I was in, a, in the Boston Public Schools teaching, and it was just like being in Hungary. Uh, you had about four inches where you could move, and you could move up and down the rows, and so you had to really think about how movement was going to be um, instituted. And so that's your materials. Um, but the rows were wide enough so that you could actually do wavelet, wavelet. <laughs> I, I would have done that. But in a, in a music classroom, um, you're singing a lot and you're interjecting movement back and forth with it. So you want to get you know, the singing going, except you can't now. Um, and then you want to do the movement. Um, my daughters are both hugely active. They, they do these exercise routines at health clubs. They run marathons. They do all this stuff. Um, they do go to an indoor ma uh, club now and they wear masks. And they may, at this juncture, because there are no mandates, they won't take off their mask. So it is possible to, um, to exercise and you know, sweat with a mask on 
So I don't think that the teacher that you were talking to, Robin, would necessarily, you know, have a problem doing the dances. I think, in fact, these the dance at yourself videos are the perfect answer to that issue. You can wear a mask, you can sweat a little bit, and have a lot of fun. Um, but then, and I don't know if Amy has had to do this. I will ask you, Amy. Um, do you have to hybrid teach? Um, well, as far as I know right now, we're going to be in the classroom. And I am blessed with a huge, huge room for um, 12 to 15 little ones. So I, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. But yeah. certainly possible. Yeah, because we may be going back to that. Um, that is so hard. So hard. So hard. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say was um, about the intricacies of dancing. Um, mostly I, I was involved, except for play party games and circle games. Um, I was involved in May Day and Revels type um, events. And those dances are very intricate and you have to teach them you know, one, you have to perfect each of the movements because they are not necessarily age appropriate when you're teaching them. Mm. Um, you know, not the idea. So I particularly have enjoyed that these videos are more simple, more like learning around and singing around. Uh, so it's a shorter chunk of, of um, knowledge that you have to have. Um, there was one more thing. The, um, the dances and the videos um, really do help you in the classroom have better flow and more ease. So two lines in a classroom is very different from two, two lines in a big spacious room. You know, how do you make those two lines happen? How do you get the same distance? Are the lines perfectly straight? Are you the same distance from your partner? And you know that to dance, you sort of need the lines perfect. <laughs> um, I think that was, that may be all that I wanted to say, Robin. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. It is a challenge, I would think, in a classroom with desks. Um, if, if teachers are on a cart um, in a classroom with desks. Um, I feel like in most schools that I'm hearing about, um, distancing has gone down to three feet instead of six, and that helps a lot in terms of spacing, um, but it also puts the desks more tightly together in those teaching classrooms. So I, I think it's gonna be a very challenging year, again, unfortunately, for a lot of people. Um, and I don't, I mean, none of us really know at all what, what the next few months are going to hold, but, um, we are excited about the next series. The next series I'm, I'm hoping to, um, expand out of my, my comfort box of, of sort of American traditional dance and song. Um, and we are, um, planning on starting uh, more in the box, but still kind of in a fun place out of the box. I know a lot of you know Janine Smith, who is a caller from the DC area. And Janine is gonna do one of her infamous seated square dances for us. So that will be just phenomenal because it will be entirely seated and it will also be for um, differently abled children and adults. Um, and I, I, my goal is to have more children be able to see themselves in the next round of videos um, from all races and creeds. And so I'm hoping that we can include some African-American singing games in there um, because they're, the dances all pretty much involve singing and polyrhythm. Um, I also want to see if there's a way, if anybody knows of, um, a Native American um, individual who would be willing to share something that can be easily taught or someone from um, one of the Hispanic Latin American traditions that has a dance that is easily taught 
that they would like to share um, in this series, I would like to know about it. I would like to have ideas for, for folks and you can either email me or um, I'll put my email in the chat.